safety. Uh, I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on, uh, I guess, gas chlorine, but also on other products that you guys might use for water or wastewater treatment uh, pertaining to chemicals and how you should handle them. I've done a number of these things over the years, and there's always a good refresher because um, it's very important when handling any products, water treatment uh, products, that um, you always are thinking about safety because um, handled improperly, it can cause uh, um, some serious injuries to you or somebody else in the community. So, um, so with that, I just I'm just going to give you a little history about talking about chlorine. Um, yeah. Hawkins brings it in in rail cars and any it repackages gas chlorine. These these cars are 90 ton, filled three quarters full of liquid uh, chlorine. We make bleach and we, and we repackage gas chlorine, 150 pound cylinders or tons out of the same product. This is just the filling operation. When you guys get a cylinder of chlorine delivered to you, um, three quarters full of that cylinder is full of liquid chlorine. The rest, the top portion of that, that container is vapor or gas. U.S. cities, um, you use and pull the product on a vapor side or a gas side. Very similar propane. So, but you need to kind of understand the event of an emergency or whatever the properties of it. Uh, this is just some data on chlorine usage. Um, water and wastewater, swimming pools, disinfection, only um, in the world, about seven, eight, nine percent um, of the usage. The rest of it's used like in pharmaceutical, plastics industry, and so on. Okay, and that's some bolts of it. Gas chlorine. Uh, we take out of that rail car and we pressurize and we fill that cylinder, and it's filled in a liquid form, three quarters full of liquid. It's a greenish yellow color. If you ever seen it. You'll, it, it's very apparent. You'd want to get the heck away from it. It's two and a half times heavier than air. It's important to know because you want to get up from it so it don't go down on the ground and crawl up. Uh, to be detected in very uh, low, less than three parts per million. Uh, this is incorrect here. It's at 60 degrees, it will no longer gas off. That's actually a negative 28 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning that. If the product gets that cold in the cylinder, it will not gas off, okay? You can, we've actually, at our, at our complex, if we've ever had a bad valve, we can take that, like those, some of these cold mornings we've had, we can actually take a cylinder out in the parking lot, and um, if the material is that cold inside that cylinder, down to negative 28, we can take and open it up and take the valve off and put a new valve on if need be. Um, and the fuse plug on there, will melt at 165, it's 158 to 165 degrees. Um, I'm going to talk about the fuse plug a little bit. If I can find the valve here. Okay. The fuse plug is right there on a valve, okay, on a chlorine cylinder. <clears throat> that is a safety mechanism for a gas chlorine cylinder, okay. Chlorine is not a high pressure gas in the cylinder form. It, uh, like I said, it boils a negative 28 Fahrenheit, meaning there's zero pressure in there, zero gas. As the temperature increases, um, the pressure will increase. Not like oxygen or acetylene or anything like that where you're talking five, six, seven hundred pounds of pressure in a cylinder, but at room temperature there's roughly 70, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit there's about 85 pounds of pressure in that container. Okay. 
That deal there on a, on a 150 cylinder and on ton cylinders, they have them on the ends of the tons, if, you, if any of you guys use those. They are a safety mechanism made is that that container is exposed to extreme heat to melt out, to keep the cylinder from rupturing. Okay, why is that important? Well, Hawkins, and, I, and not just Hawkins, chlorine uh, producers around the country, especially in the upper and northern regions, have issues occasionally where those things melt out. I had one about two weeks ago um, in a community um, down in southern Minnesota on a Friday night, they called and said they got a gas chlorine leak. And what had happened is the heater inside the, in the chlorine room had malfunctioned and stuck on. And it got so it got it got up to the temperature of 150 some degrees, and it melted off. That thing melted off. If you guys done soldering before, you'll see the drip on the cylinder and stuff, and then started leaking out chlorine. The reason I tell you this stuff is because each one of you that have gas chlorine, make sure in your chlorine room, if you have heaters in there, they're in good condition uh, and they're out and they operate efficiently. Chlorine is corrosive with the, with the presence of moisture, okay? meaning the chlorine inside the cylinder, when we fill it, has got a pH of about 1. And it doesn't attack that cylinder while it's steel, even though it's a one pH. With moisture present, water, atmospheric moisture, um, or humidity, I should say, um, it gets, it makes it corrosive, hypochlorous acid. In your chlorine rooms, if you have them, you'll see, you know, uh, a lot of the metal that's corroded and stuff. That's every time you unhook a cylinder or whatever, you maybe get a puff of chlorine or whatever. That combines with the moisture in the, in the air, and it just it is it's corroding at it. Okay, so you want to make sure that those heaters that are in there work good, and make sure they don't pull on the cylinder. Okay, so if you got some of my semen well houses that are hanging up in the air above the cylinders, make sure they're not pointing right on them. Okay, if they if they're in bad condition, look at replacing them if you even need them. A lot of cases you don't need to have a heater in there unless you have water in your chlorine room. So I know that you know during design phases of, of, of facilities and stuff, a lot of times there'll be heaters put in there. You might not even need it in there. It, and so talk to your supplier and stuff on chlorine because most cases you can pull enough chlorine out of a cylinder without even having a heater in there. Make any sense or not, but check that. Like I said. We end up with about one or two a year, it seems like. And if you want to have a bad weekend or a bad night, you, you know, chlorine leak will do it. So, um, with everybody in their belly button shows up generally. So, um, this is a ton container. If you guys have any of you have a ton, uh, utilized ton that has two cylinder or two valves on a ton. You pull out on the top cylinder or top valve. If you can see here, there's dip legs in these in these containers, and the top one goes up into the vapor portion of the cylinder because this also would be three quarters full of liquid. Um, it's important to know that when you and we'll go through a hookup on a cylinder, but you you want to make sure you hook up a stock tank and uh, chlorinator correctly because you can pull liquid into your head. Oh, one more thing. Um, the liquid inside that cylinder that's filled, it'll magnify 460 volumes. Okay? And that means if I could physically go into a cylinder and pull a cup of liquid chlorine out of it and set it on a table, it would gas off to 460 volumes or 460 cups of gas. Okay? Have you ever had a leak and it was spewing out liquid chlorine for any instance? Emergency response would want to just turn that cylinder to the gas side of it because it will um, it'll be a controlled leak. That if it's pouring liquid out of it, it is an uncontrolled leak. Now that cylinder we had a couple weeks ago, we got called. I think it was at 3:34 o'clock in the afternoon. 
They had found it relatively quick because they have leak detectors in their chlorine room. And they responded, the fire department come out and what they had done is they put a C-clamp on that, uh, on that fuse plug, just a uh, regular C-clamp and a piece of rubber, and sealed it off, okay? So it was, it was, it stopped. And then we went down and put it in a, what's a chlorine cop, and I don't know if I have any pictures of those, but it's like a torpedo. You could throw it in there and shut it up, and, it's, and you could use it to transport it. Now that thing, that cylinder, only leaked a couple of pounds of chlorine. They had it on a scale so they could tell. And the reason why, you aren't going to empty a whole cylinder out. It'd take probably close to a day's time if you had a full cylinder for a chlorine to pour out of that little, it's about the size of a pencil, not even that. But what'll happen is when it rushes out of there, chlorine will freeze that cylinder down. Okay? And it'll freeze it down so it can't gas off, it'll get down to you know, like I said, down to negative 28 almost. You can, some of you guys will see that stuff happen in the summertime when you pump your wells really hard. You'll see ice form up on the outside of the cylinder. And that's because you're pulling so fast and it's cooling the, uh, the content down. That's kind of, it's a controlled leak because it takes and freeze thaw, so. That's just a shut off system. Okay, if you use gas chlorine, make sure they're chained up when they're in operation. Or if they're sitting against the wall. Very important because you wouldn't want to bust the tip one over and bust the valve off. Chlorine houses should be locked and fire resistant. Okay, the lock portion, um, we as a manufacturer and repackager uh, have uh, had to uh, 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 comply the Department of Homeland Security and they did an audit uh, sent us some stuff about five years ago four years ago and 600 paid questionnaire on each one of our facilities and security is a big deal big big deal with handling uh, what they call COIs chemical interest chlorine is one of them and we've had to spend a lot of money on infrastructure uh, to make sure that the products are safe. I am guessing at some point in life that the same type of regulations or similar are going to come down to the municipal water users, okay? It might be, a lot of you might be retired before that happens, I can't say. But the big thing is, is that any of your products, it be a gas chlorine or permanganate or whatever it may be, you want to make sure that your well houses, your cabinets, whatever you have, that are not accessible to the general public. Only the people that you want to be in there, okay? Because concern is that these get these products get in the wrong hands. They can do things with them that aren't so nice, obviously, and that what they worry about is terrorists and so on and so forth. And a terrorist could be anybody. But make sure if you have facilities that they're secure. I can remember 20 years ago driving around and delivering chlorine, and it, and it wasn't uncommon to see chlorine bottles outside of a well house chained up. And you know, it was no big deal. Nobody screwed with them. So make sure that doesn't exist today. If you're doing yourself a favor. Uh, to be lethal, if you're if you're if you're in a confined area, I don't you'd have to have some pretty poor luck to have it be lethal. But um, make sure they're secure. Um, eye wash stations, good idea to have an eye wash station around it. Um, keep the wrench on the cylinder so it's very quick. When you open up a cylinder, I think I got this in here. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Um, when you open up a cylinder, when you hook up a chlorine cylinder, um, the proper way to do it on a ton or 150 is shut the cylinder off. Make sure you shut it off. Let it draw a vacuum. All right. Then you want to unhook the cylinder, the regulator, 
put it off to the side and cap the valve right away and put the hood on it. Then you roll the next cylinder into place, and if it's a ton, you did just basically the same thing. And you hook the, you put a new lead washer on every time you hook up a regulator. If one comes with the cylinder, it's a good idea to have extra ones on hand. Put a new lead washer on the back of the regulator. I think most of you guys have done it in here. And then you want to take and take and squeeze or tighten it down by hand, the regulator. So you're making sure it's square on the bell. Almost similar like putting a car tire on. And then take your wrench and tighten down that regulator so that lead washer just starts to mushroom. Okay? That's perfect. All right? Take your wrench and open up the cylinder and shut it right away. If you have a leak, um, it'll be apparent. Take an ammonia solution bottle. It's got to be a 3%. The household does not work very well. Get it from your supplier. And take the vapors around there. If you have a leak, it will show if the white cigarette smell or smoke. If it does not leak, put it online and open it up a half a turn. That's all you got to open up a cylinder, a half a turn for chlorine or SO2. Okay. You're good to go. Leave the wrench on there because if you ever have to shut it down, you can reach in there and shut it down. A ton, same thing. Okay. Except you don't want to put a ton online right away. You want to have it and not draw it because those dip legs you saw on a ton can hold liquid, and if you're pulling on it, you'll pull liquid through the head. I'm covering a lot of stuff quick here because of the time. So, um, so that's basically it on chlorine, you understand? No, it's a good idea if you have gas chlorine or SO2, let your fire departments know, local fire departments, and what you guys have got. So that, and you should have signage on the doors, and, and they need to know, you know, in the event of an emergency, what to do also. Not all cities have the ability to handle a chlorine leak, but most of there's cities around you that do. So that you just communicate with your fire chief and stuff, and just let them know, okay? I think chlorine, gas chlorine, is probably the safest way to disinfect. Okay. have very few incidences because people follow procedures and they treat it with respect okay versus bleach or, or anything bills have the same issues as gas chlorine they can all right I'll talk about bleach because I'm sure some of you guys have uh, used it for disinfection azone sodium hypochlorite a lot of different trade names out there uh, that no different than what you use in your households for washing clothes, okay? The difference is it's, the stuff on a wash tub is five and a half percent. The stuff that you use for water treatment, wastewater treatment, swimming pools, whatever it may be, is 12 and a half percent. What does that mean? That means that at every gallon that you get, there's 1.25 pounds of chlorine in that gallon, all right? So we take that chlorine out of the rail car in a liquid form, and then we take and we put caustic soda with it, all right? Chlorine is very insoluble in water. When we feed it into the system, it takes a while for it to mix up. We put chlorine, we put caustic in there, and the rest is inert water. The caustic puts a roof on top of that chlorine. So it doesn't let the chlorine come out, that 1.25 pounds coming out of your, uh, out of your gallon. That's all it's doing. It's got a, but the pH of the product is about 13 now, 12 and a half. Important thing to know is that you never want to introduce an acid to that sodium hypochlorite or bleach solution. Because what that'll do is it'll chisel a hole in that, you can look at this caustic as being a rough, keeping it in there. It'll allow that chlorine to come out. And it'll come out right now. So you have an uncontrolled leak at that point, unlike gas chlorine, and it happens. You got fluoride in your well house, that's an acid. If you get that combined with, with bleach, you got an issue, okay? Never introduce anything other than water with these products. Make sure you're doing it correctly, okay? Now, I don't have enough time to talk about all the chemicals. However, 
the ones that you guys commonly use oops, are fluoride. It's got a pH about four. Stay locked. Most of you feed in your water systems. Sodium hypochlorite, got a pH of about 12 and a half. Your body has got a pH of about 7.2, 7, 7.4, 7.6. Okay? Why is that important? You've all jumped into a swimming pool before and you've got an eye irritation, correct? And you go, damn, the chlorine's high in here. But it generally it's not. It's generally that the pH is out of whack a little bit in that swimming pool and it causes some mild irritation to your skin or to your eyes. So, when you deviate from that neutral range, it causes more irritation. You get fluoride, we call fluoride a mild acid, it's 4.0, or sodium hypochlorite, that's 12 and a half, that's quite a ways from 7.2. <coughs> it causes chemical burns now, okay? So, it is extremely important, and I don't care what product you're working with or you're around these things, you wear eye protection. Okay. Wear rubber gloves. You're going to your chemical. Good idea just to put on a pair of safety glasses. Really is. Because you never know when something's going to happen. And I live with the, I mean, I've, I've cut corners a lot in my life, and every time, and not every time, but that's when stuff happens. So if you don't have them, try to get some safety glasses available and have an eye wash station available. Because if you get this stuff on it, you're going to want to protect, number one, your eyes. So, um, Q&A, any questions? Q&A, any questions? Anybody have anything for Mike? Go ahead. Mike, how often should you change the plastic lens that go over from the control over to the injector? The question is, how often should we change your chemical feed lines, right? Yep. Um, on any chemical. That varies. Depends on the product. Depends on the pressure. Depends on if it's exposed to sunlight. Typically, um, chemical feed equipment, I, I would recommend maybe changing it every year. Um, not that it's going to go bad in a year's time, but you know, I would look at it year to two years, okay? The chlorine, gas chlorine, You'll know it when it's time to uh, change that because it's going to get brittle on you. You're going to go out and hook up a tubing or whatever, or a regulator, and it's going to start breaking on you. And um, that's that's kind of one of the time goes. But I'd recommend every year, year and a half. I don't think it needs to be done any more often than that. So, it, you know, it's just like chemical tanks. How often do you change your chemical tanks? Well. If you're a manufacturer of chemical feed tanks, they'll say three years, okay? Reality is, that, that ain't the case. I mean, you can get a lot of years of service out of a chemical, your chemical tanks in, in good conditions. We at our company, we go, we change our bulk tanks out every 10 years. Okay? Not a bad idea. Um, boy, if one of those things break, you got a mess. And then you got, you have responsibility to call the duty officer and whatever, you know, and it could, so, for a small investment, it ain't a bad idea to change some of that stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? I mean, cover a lot of stuff quick. All right, uh, which booth oh. are you in? We, we got to keep moving, so. Which booth are you in, Mike? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Three something down there. We're out of time, so if you have further questions, I can be with you in the back of the room if you Fall on down to the exhibit hall or the back of the room. We got to keep on schedule here, but. Good job, Michael. Thank you, guys. Thank you.